So Sabrina brought up an excellent point, the July 1st transition. Um, so the Bureau took a lot of heat when we did not extend the transition period. Um, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on us to extend it. We did not, uh, we did not change our regulations and we did not extend it. I'm one question, two questions for the panel. How did you feel about that decision and how did it affect your business operations? You know, my personal feelings about the decision were that um, I had been approached by some retail operators and other operators in the industry to um, to put my name with those who were who were asking for an extension. And um, for ourselves as a laboratory, um, an extension wasn't really going to be material one way or another in terms of readiness or our execution because we were already doing what we needed to do for July 1st. But what I was seeing was that um, having to do with the inventory that was being held and valuation of inventory that was either owned by yourself or by another party that, that you were in contract with, that the particulars around the ownerships of those inventories and the date of its production, in some cases, because the, um, the deadlines either weren't understood or anticipated with respect to when things were manufactured or harvested and when they could continue to be sold, that I became aware of certain people who I personally cared about a lot. Uh, that were going to take enormous losses that could potentially put them out of business as small business owners. And so as a small business owner and entrepreneur, I have a lot of compassion for those people. And um, I, was, I was dismayed that they were having such a negative impact because I've known them s since my company was uh, founded eight and a half years ago. And to be in business for eight and a half years or ten years and suffer that kind of blow in, in, a, in one that you really can't affect and, and, and maybe it's their own responsibility and their own fault because they weren't prepared or they weren't engaged and that may have been why it happened. But it was unfortunate, just as a, as a, from a humanistic perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it was unfortunate uh, to watch that happen for people. Yeah, um, I, I personally, I would have liked to see an extension um, for all, all the reasons that you said. The, um, uh, I, I do wonder though, if we had extended, I'm sure this is part of what informed the decision not to is, would it have been any different another six months hence, right? So um, personally, I would have liked to see extens uh, an extension because I think that it needs to be a smoother transition um, from the, the unregulated to the regulated market. From a business perspective, though, um, anticipated that it would be held hard and so uh, to that July date, so we amped up for it and um, uh, there was a lot of market share to be got during that period as a result. Um, and then lastly, just, uh, you know, kind of embarrassed by the Instagram and social media posts of just all these empty shelves throughout our state. Um, one of the biggest, you know, concerns I have is uh, the, the lack of dispensaries in our, in our market, um, being a whole supply chain company. So I, I uh, hope to see those shelves filled again, and that's a robust market. So it's a little scary how much of a reset it was. Yeah, I agree. I think it would have been delaying the inevitable um, if you had just moved it and there, the reactions would have been the same. I, it, I, I made sure that, um, you know, that the buyers at BPG were in communication with their vendors to make sure that they were as prepared as they can be and, and you know, how that communication gets through and whether it's received on that end, I, I don't know, but I, I, I think that it, it definitely helped to provide a sort of a process for them because a lot of them didn't really know what to do or what was even going on or that there was even a July 1st deadline. And, um, you know, just in, to ensure that we did have enough products and, and um, you know, didn't lose out on any of that and all of the testing. And Berkeley's testing standards have always been extremely high and the highest in the state. So most of the vendors that we worked with were pretty used to you know, meeting those rules anyway. So the testing wasn't as much of an issue as the packaging and labeling, mm -hmm. which also kicked off a lot of uh, discussions and arguments. But I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it better to happen now and to have everybody adjust right now if this is all, it's inevitable. And, um, you know, we've been fighting for this for a really long time and here we are. So this is what it looks like. And I just look at it as growing pains mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's really hard to see, um, you know, like you said, some of the, these um, smaller business owners that um, just don't have the resources or, or the bandwidth to really keep up with all of these things and, and find themselves in a situation where they're not completely able to 
complied to the extent that they can get their stuff online right away. I think a lot of this is a very um, uh, flexible, creative industry that has managed to survive through many challenges in the past. And I think that that spirit will continue on and people can be um, innovative and, and find a way. So I, I think it was, it was good. Yeah, I would say that uh, despite preparation um, beginning in June for the July 1st changes, the end of that grace period, um, you know, Flocana suffered significantly in uh, early July as uh, we didn't agree with our retail clients on what were the packaging requirements. And that was, that was really challenging uh, to not see eye to eye, have us all trying to comply but disagree about what the rules said. That was very challenging. And um, at the same time, despite the pain that we felt and what I assume many, many companies felt, I would say that I, I still salute the BCC for not flexing on that because this is the beginning of the relationship of there's an open period where we all get to talk about what the rules should be and then we will enforce the rules. And so I salute you for enforcing the rules when it was time to enforce the rules. And we learned that this is, this is a, sort of a, a, a weak link situation, a weakest link situation in the industry where those who, and we're gonna confront it again in the near future, probably when these regs go final, um, we will have those who didn't prepare enough and businesses will choose, oh, you're not prepared, I'm not gonna do business with you right now. And that may be a make or break moment for those who didn't prepare, mm -hmm. and yet, that is the way this industry and any industry works. You know, it's competition, and we can seek to outcompete each other on compliance to the state's benefit. And I think a lot of farmers were kind of caught off guard. I mean, granted, the transition period was published, but we're transitioning away from kind of a bulk flower market. So traditionally, cultivators have provided bulk flour into the retail sector, and that's how it's gone into vending departments. So a lot of cultivators weren't prepared for packaging. They didn't have a brand. They didn't have um, containers. They were used to bringing whole pound units and then having the dispensary package. And so when you're in a position to try to or have to start figuring out packaging, First of all, the time frame on that is, you know, six to six months to a year to just try to figure out how to source and how to put together compliant packaging. So as Humboldt's Finest, we started our rebrand for compliant packaging in January. And what we what came what we came up against was that as early as April, the distributors we were working with were like, oh, no, no, we're not taking any more product unless it's prepped for July. And we're like, oh, my gosh, this is kind of crushing because here we have packaged product that, you know, should have been able to be on the shelves until July. And then our, our distributors were kicking it back because they didn't want to have anything in their stock, right, come July 1st that wasn't compliant. So we'd already been doing the testing, and for us, it was dealing with the child-resistant packaging component, especially when we looked at pre-rolls. We do a lot of pre-roll cigarette or cannabis cigarettes, so trying to figure out how to, especially in single serving sizes, manage that CRP component was really challenging, and it was expensive. But we're there, and I think if people didn't plan, you know, six, nine months in advance, they really got caught off guard with it. And so it's, it's a, you had to basically have a point person that you could put on that and the resources to do it to be prepared is what we found. You know, one point to add on, I think that was actually really important about the July transition uh, that's very focused on the lab sector was the increase in testing requirements and the increase in the compound lists because the phase one pesticide list really didn't encompass what's normally used on cannabis and the things that we're usually the most concerned about finding. And so I think that um, delaying the implementation of the phase two pesticide list especially would have definitely been an error. Yeah. That really, it's really helpful to hear it from your perspective.